My name is John Passfield. The title of this reading will be Ellen Montgomery, video 18, poem 2. So here is my novel, Ellen Montgomery, I Gave You Life, a novel by John Passfield, a photograph of the historical Ellen Montgomery from about 1938. Now, in 1938, with another World War looming and her own personal problems threatening to overwhelm her, Acclaimed Canadian author Ella Montgomery begins to write what she's decided will be her final Anne novel. As she works on the new book, she recalls the days when Anne of Green Gables became a worldwide literary phenomenon and the dilemma that she faced at that time, whether to write a series of novels in which Anne would perpetually remain the child the world had come to know and love, or to allow Anne to grow to adulthood with all the agonizing torments of the one who had given her life, L.M. Montgomery. Now, three novels to keep in mind. L.M. Montgomery, I Gave a Life, in which L.M. Montgomery is a character. Now, the character L.M. Montgomery in my novel is writing a new novel of, in 1938, and it's going to turn out to be Anne of Ingleside. She has decided that this will be the last novel in which Anne will appear as a character. Chronologically, it's a, a middle novel of eight, but um, in terms of writing, it'll be the last one she'll write with Anne as a character. She's decided that, she's determined. Now, as she works on it, her mind goes back to the first Anne novel, the first novel in which Anne appears as a character. In 1938-1905, 33 years apart, what was I thinking as I was working on the first Anne novel? Well, after it was written and published and became a phenomenon, her publisher said, will you write more Anne novels? And then the question became, in the mind of Ellen Montgomery, sure I will, but will I keep Anne as a child or will I let her grow to, let her grow to adulthood? Now, having, in 1938, had her own adulthood, the young author of Anna Green Gables wonders whether she made the right choice. Should I have let Anne have an adulthood, considering what my adulthood has been? Okay. In a previous video, I read what I called Poem 1, although there are no headings in the text of the novel. In the introduction to that video presentation, I suggested that it's a subconscious level of her mind of the mind, sorry, we think in imagery, and that the poem is a literary technical device which indicates the subconscious imagery creating level of thought in the human mind. In this video presentation, I'm going to read what I call Poem 2. So, let's go to page 5 then. Now, there's one per chapter for 16 chapters of thought. So, it's a little awkward when I'm looking for pages here, but the point is, there's only one verse in each chapter, and the individual verses comment on the other images in that chapter, and the entire 16 verses, which I call an image arc, uh, comments on all of the thoughts, all of the 50,000 words of thoughts, and that's why I, I choose this rather awkward way of reading, because it um, it's a point that's being made. Okay, so... Poem uh, 2, if I can find it here. Here it is. <clears throat> dark the night and dark the wood was when I traveled there. Then we go to uh, page 12, which is seven more pages. I lost the thing I never had was only... In my dreams. Uh, page 20. A ring was lost, so I heard tell, was lost among the woods. Page 28. The ring would glow when all was dark was glowing in the woods. Uh, 36. Ignore I did the sunshine. Ignore I did the light. 44. 
was others stood outside the wood, I did ignore them too. Uh, 52. I hoped the moon would not be seen, so I could better see. 60. I cursed the light and wished it gone. I only wanted dark. Uh, 68. I waited for the darkness fall. I plunged into the woods. 76. I never saw, nor ray, nor glow, was all I saw, was dark. Um, 86. No lantern brought I to the wood, I did not want its glow. 94. was thrashing through the underbrush, was searching high and low. 104. Fell down, got up, fell down again. I could not see my way. 112. Slashed by bramble, cut by thorn, felt blood upon my hands. 120. Could feel the glow, could smell the glow, but never saw the ring. And the last one, on page 128. All I could hear was other ones were thrashing in the dark. Now that's what I call poem number two, but as I said, there's no headings in the uh, novel. These are simply images that are embedded in the chapters. In the previous video that I mentioned, in which I read poem one, I suggested that our thoughts could be divided into two categories, the conscious and the subconscious. For the reading of this poem, I would like to suggest that there's another way of dividing the image-making function of our minds. I would suggest that some of the images and the image patterns in our mind are what I would call active imagery, and some of the images and image patterns in our minds are what I would call latent imagery, L-A-T-E-N-T, -E latent imagery. A very simple example of how latent imagery can become active imagery is a process of memory. We are told that everything we experience during our lifetime is captured and retained in the mind. However, often these items of information seem to be no more than information. They don't seem to offer any interpretive function, by which I mean that they don't seem to be capable of offering a means of interpreting other information in our minds by the simple process of juxtaposing themselves, of placing themselves beside other pieces of information. So a piece of information might lie in the mind, might be latent in the mind for many years, and then when something new happens to us, a former experience, an earlier item of information, is suddenly transformed from latent, unimportant, insignificant information to active important, significant imagery in our minds. Now, I would suggest that what the image poem does, what these two image poems do in the mind of the main character, Ellen Montgomery, might well be to, uh, sorry, might well be to act not so much as active or latent images or image patterns themselves, since neither one seems to be based on the everyday reality of the main character's life experience, but they are acting as catalysts, as image catalysts, by which I mean that even though a piece of information might have lain passively in the mind of the main character for many years, and no other piece of information in the mind of the main character has turned that original item of information into active imagery, these poems 
when juxtaposed with the everyday information of the life of the main character cause that information to become life interpretive cause that information to act as imagery which illuminates many of the other items of information in the main character's mind so we we readers can ask ourselves what these poems which i've labeled poems one and two have to say about the information of her life experience when placed side by side, which until now, until the present moment of the thinking of this 50,000 word thought in the mind of the main character has been latent, inactive, unconsidered, not thought about. So to modify my earlier statement, there are actually three categories of subconscious imagery, active imagery, latent imagery, and catalyst imagery. Incidentally, the most famous catalyst imagery in literature is probably the Madeleine dipped in tea in A La Recherche du Temps Perdu by Marcel Proust, which converts seven volumes of latent imagery into active imagery. Marcel lives his whole life with information in his head. It isn't until he dips a Madeleine, which is a little cookie, into tea and tastes it. It has, it's the same action he performed when he was a little boy. It has the same taste that it had when he was a little boy. All of the information of the years between him being a little boy and him being an adult suddenly comes alive. A catalyst, an image catalyst, has uh, brought those images alive as interpretive images. He can now understand his own life. So it's the most famous catalyst image in, in literature, I would say. Once again, then, this is my novel, Ella Montgomery. I gave you Life, a novel by John Passfield. It's found on Amazon, where there's more information. It's found on my publisher's website, rocksmillspress.com, and on my website, a planning notebook and a journal. Both are full-length books. You just click on the icon, and there they are. And they tell you what I was thinking as I was planning and writing the novel and what I was thinking as I was polishing the novel. So have a look at those two books if you're interested for free. Um, just click on the icon and there they are. Lastly, I'll say thank you for watching this video.